This is Hannibal here from the Hannibal TV.com, and I have a very special guest today, the star of one of my favorite wrestling movies, Grunt the Wrestling Movie. He was in Over the Top. He was in Lionheart with Jean-Claude Van Damme. He was in Tag Team with Jesse Ventura and Roddy Piper, tons of other movies that we're going to cover in, in this interview. Magic Schwartz, who was also a wrestler. How are you doing today, sir? I'm good, man. I'm glad to be here. Well, we're glad to have you. To get this started, do you want to just tell us a little bit about uh, growing up in Texas and understand at one point in time you even were friends with Bruiser Brody? Yeah, I grew up in San Antonio pretty much, and uh, uh, Brody and I trained at the same gym together, and we've got to be good friends, and we didn't see each other for about 15 years. And then one night I wrestled in Vegas and he was my opponent. So it was pretty crazy. Uh, it was a great time. He was a great guy. He's just pretty radical guy. He never listened to anybody and nobody could tell him what to do. So he played by his own rules, but yeah, living in Texas, uh, there was a lot of wrestlers there in my home city. Blanchard was one of them, you know, Tully and Joe Blanchard. Uh, a lot of good guys and our gym was kind of a hub for all the boys that came through town like Jimmy Snuka and John Studd and all those guys every time they were in town they always came to our gym so I got to know a lot of them before I ever got into wrestling business. Now I'm gonna guess Bruiser Brody didn't rough you up too much when you were in there with him because you were friends. To be honest with you I don't think he even remembered who I was because uh uh, I got a pile driver from him and I ended up walking back to the dressing room and I was headed to the wrong dressing room. So they stopped me on kind of pointed me in the right way. Cause I was just about unconscious, but Brody, uh, pretty stiff wrestler. He had his way with it's about everybody. He wouldn't, uh, he wouldn't be easy on you even if he knew you. Now, Rick Bassman told me that you were one of the guys that, people really wouldn't want to mess with. Uh, were you like that from a young age or is that something that developed as you got older? Uh, well, you know, I was in a motorcycle club and I got out of that because I had good enough sense to get away from that. But no, I never was a badass. I was always a real friendly guy. Uh, I learned how to fight. I did two years of UFC when it first started. So, uh, as I learned how to take care of myself, I became a bodyguard and I worked for some really famous people. And uh, I was never really classified as a badass. I was always friendly with everybody. I didn't realize, I knew that you uh, were in no holds barred fighting, but I didn't realize that was actually the UFC. Was it actually uh, ultimate fighting championship you fought in? Yes. It was really early days when like chemo and Gracie and tank Abbott and all those guys and shamrock, uh, we didn't wear gloves and there was no rounds, so it was pretty radical. And I got into it fairly late in life, so one day I just decided I was too old for it, so I, I left that, just went back into movie business. I read on your website that you're an adrenaline junkie. Is that kind of why you went into the UFC, just for the adventure of it? Well, being a movie actor, I was a stunt guy for 25 years, and once you develop the talent to be in stunts and stuff like that, you have to, you have to almost scare yourself a lot to have fun. So I guess that's how the adrenaline junkie thing came about. And I understand you also trained at the original Gold's gym and you were the, the first personal trainer ever there training people like Jane Fonda. What was that experience like being there in those early days with, with all those stars that uh, trained there at the time? Well, I was considered pretty much the underground mayor of Gold's Gym. I was the original member when it moved to Santa Monica. I was the first member. But I also went to the old gym in Santa Monica and trained with Ken Waller and Frank Zane and all those guys. So I got to know everybody in the bodybuilding world and trained with just about every one of them. It was a great experience. I, I wouldn't change it. Uh, I Like I said, like you said, I was the first personal trainer. And my clientele, uh, nobody knew what to charge back then. So I was charging like $100 a week, which was crazy back then for the amount of money you could make as a trainer. And yes, I had Michael Landon. I had the, I was off-season strength coach for the LA Raiders at one point, training them in Gold's Gym. Uh, 
but I had a lot of good athletes that I trained Willie Banks, Flo Jo, a few of just the name mentioned a few, Howie Long, Lal Zato, Bo Jackson. So it was, it was a real good experience. And I met a lot of really cool people along the way. And like I said, I wouldn't change it. I look forward to remembering a lot of the memories from that place. Hopefully it stays open. Now, Rick Drayson just passed away. I know you knew him from those days. Any memories of him that you could share with us after his unfortunate death on Sunday? Rick was a great artist, and obviously everybody knows he designed the logo for Gold's Gym, the original logo. Uh, Rick and I kind of knew each other through bodybuilding. Uh, at one point, we wrestled together as a tag team. Uh, that was probably the, one of the last wrestling matches I did. The, the official last wrestling match I did was with uh, Dr. D. David Schultz. But we'll get into that story later. But Rick was a good guy, real talented, well-liked, knew a lot of people, also had a movie career like myself. So he was a good guy. I'm sorry to see he passed away. Now, you told me when we were on the phone earlier that it was Michael Langdon that got you into acting. Did you get into acting before you got into wrestling? Well, uh, actually, my first acting job was uh, this guy came into Gold's Gym and pulled me over to the railing and said, I, I want to do a biker movie and you're perfect for it. Well, it was it ended up being Roger Corbin. So he was the king of the B movies. So that was my first big movie. And then right after that, uh, I met Michael, and started training him. And he put me in Highway to Heaven uh, twice and I was in a little house on the prairie. And I was a consultant to the director on a couple of episodes he did at Gold's Gym to kind of show him the layout and how to structure their shot for the for the series. So, yeah, it was Michael. I was married in Michael Landon's house. He was my best man. My first wedding. Great guy. Most honest person I ever met. Hardworking. Very talented. Now, at what point did you become friends with Sylvester Stallone? Uh. I actually trained him at his house and uh, I ended up, I invented the total gym back then and I didn't pursue and got ripped off from me basically. But I used the machine that I had that was a total gym and I would go to his house and train him and we got to be good friends. So that's how I got in the movie. He decided he wanted to use me in over the top, which was a pretty intense movie. Uh, the guy that slaps me in the face is Richie Giacchetti, which was Mike Tyson's boxing coach. And got along great with Sly. Always treated me well. Never had a bad word to say about him. Did you have any arm wrestling experience prior to that movie? No. Uh, Sly had just finished a Rocky movie when I worked with him and over the top. And his right hand was broken from uh, boxing for that movie. And I had to grab his hand and act like I'm trying to kill him, but barely squeeze his hand. He uh, he got a lot of uh, info from arm wrestlers that kind of showed him what to do and how to act. But he had never had any wrestling, arm wrestling experience before that. I see. We interviewed uh, an arm wrestling world champion named Devin Larratt the other day. And he said you were his favorite character from over the top. Uh, so that Smasher character was definitely iconic. Uh, they used my promo a lot in the 80s movies. For some reason, they liked it. It was a pretty intense scene. I think one of the most intense in the movies. But uh, yes, everybody, that, all my fans loved that scene. And that was part of the movie that they liked the most. So uh, I liked it. It was fun. Did you have much contact with Terry Funk and Scott Norton during the filming of that movie? Oh, yeah. Harry, Terry and I hung out together because we shot it in Vegas. My scene was actually in, in uh, Magic Mountain at a truck stop. And uh, Terry and I hung out in Vegas because I went there. I knew he was in the movie, so I went there. And we hung out together. And I watched him do some of his scenes. And, you know, great individual, probably one of my best friends. Now, one of my favorite wrestling movies was Grunt, the wrestling movie that a lot of fans may not have seen, but it has a cult following. You played Mad Dog, Joe DiCurso in that film, kind of the co-star with the mask who I think Steve Strong played. How did you get involved in that? And 
do you have any stories or memories of that film you could share with us? Well, there's a real famous garage in Los Angeles. It's called Gill's Garage. That's where all the Lucha Libre wrestlers from Mexico came and trained. Okay. Uh, one of the casting people that worked at Gold's Gym that got a lot of bodybuilders movies roles uh, hooked me up with the, the casting director from Grunt. And I had never had any wrestling experience. So they hired Mondo Guerrero as a coach. My coach was Mondo Guerrero. So he, I went to Gil's garage and I learned to wrestle with Mexican wrestlers uh, strictly to get the lead role in this movie. And uh, Skull Crusher was a very famous Mexican wrestler. Uh, and there was a lot of Mexican wrestlers in there with me that are real famous. A lot of them, I can't recall their names, but uh, Victor Rivera was Skull Crusher, a very famous Cuban wrestler. But uh, after that movie, uh, Steve Strong and I actually wrestled at the end of that movie. And later on, we did a, a TV episode together called Tales from the Dark Sides. And I played a, a really weird, crazy character from hell that came out of a Coke machine that wrestled Steve. But back to Grunt, uh, Mondo taught me how to wrestle. I had to learn how to wrestle in two weeks. So after that movie was over, I made a career out of professional wrestling because of that movie. How was the pay for that movie? Would that have been one of your higher paying jobs because it was you were the star of it or over the top and some of these other big movies you were involved with still, still pay more? No, I didn't make a whole lot of money off Grunt. I, I did pretty well, but uh, obviously I became a Screen Actors Guild actor after Over the Top, so my pay scale increased like five or tenfold. So I, I did make some money with Grunt. Uh, a lot of stunts that I did, I didn't get paid for because I didn't really know the ropes of the business. But I learned a lot, and because of that movie, I became a pretty good wrestler. How did you like working with uh, Steve Capella, who was Steve Strong? Steve is an incredible guy, uh, very friendly, and probably one of the most talented artists I think I've ever met. I don't know if people know that about him, but uh, Steve was a surfer in Venice and uh, trained at Gold's Gym a little bit, but mostly at World's Gym. We didn't run into each other a whole lot, except maybe down the beach or something. But Steve was a great wrestler, a real talented guy big guy and I always had great scenes with him every time I work with him. What did you think about the bad comedy they used in that movie? Cause I think it could have had a little bit more potential if they didn't put so many cheesy jokes in into grunt. Well, that movie was basically a cult movie and the director of the movie wanted it to be sort of a cultish type film that, it wasn't a blockbuster, obviously, but it was it was a lot of fun if you look at it. It had a lot of fine moments in it. But like you said, it was kind of corny. And the people who followed wrestling really didn't appreciate it for a wrestling movie. But as you saw, Sean Anna made a song, the theme song for Grunt. It actually had my, one of my scenes of wrestling in the video. But... Uh, like I said, it was a cult movie. It was made to be a cult movie, and that's probably all it'll ever be. But I think if it was released now, it'd probably be a lot more famous. Yes, and Adrian Street was also in that movie. Did you have much contact with him during the filming? Oh, yeah. We uh, we all hung out together, obviously, waiting our scenes to be filmed. But uh, we had a battle royale that we all got in there together. It was a lot of really famous guys. The Goliath, Mexican wrestler, uh, Jack Armstrong, one of my favorite friends, uh, just, you know, on and on and on. There was a lot of famous Jake, Jay, the Alaskan was in it. He passed away, but, uh, a lot of really famous guys, you know, Danny Spivey too was in it actually. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Danny Spivey. And I have seen some of Steve Strong's artwork because he's still close with, uh, Billy Graham, who I'm friends with, and Billy Graham has a couple of his pieces, and you're you're correct. He does really fine art. Oh man, he does oceanic art. It's probably one of the best I've ever seen. I've got I've actually got one of Billy Graham's paintings up here on my wall that he signed for me in Vegas. 
Yeah, I saw a picture of you and Billy on your website. Uh, I don't know it off the top of my head. What is it for people that want to check out your website? My website? Yes. It's magicschwartz.com. S-C-H-W-A-R-Z. Yeah, I would highly suggest people to, to look at look at the pictures that he has on that site. There's some great pictures, but how do you know Billy Graham? Was that just running across him through your years in the business together? Billy Graham was supposed to do the part that I did in Over the Top, and we were the last two choices for the casting director to choose from. So I met Billy in the hallway right before we went in and read for our parts. That's how I met him. Really? I did not know that. Wow. Now, there's a fan on here asking, any thoughts on Penitentiary 3 that I know you were in? Uh, Penitentiary 3, I was probably in the best shape of my life ever. I weighed about 280 and changed there. And uh, I, I wore out three stunt guys doing the fight scene and, and the, the little uh, fight scene we did in the end. And I had to be kind of like the assistant stunt coordinator on that movie as well. But uh, that was a low budget movie and it was all shot pretty much in the middle of the night, like two or three in the morning. And it was long drawn out. Let me tell you, and Tony, Tony Geary was in that movie as well. I, I never, I was real surprised that he showed up in that movie. Now, Lionheart is my favorite Jean-Claude Van Damme movie, and you're in it. You're in, I think, the racquetball court fight with him. Yep. Any memories of that and, and what Jean-Claude was like to work with? Uh, Jean-Claude has, you know, got an ego, obviously, but uh, we did a scene in the racquetball court where he's supposed to kick me, and I fly back into the glass racquetball wall and bounce off and come back to him and he kicks me again of course i go back in the racquetball court again wall and we the first time we did it we almost broke the real glass in the racquetball court so the so the producer said let's stop this and and redo the scene into a warehouse with real glass so we can break it and make it look realistic well when John Claude kicked me, I said, look, you need to kick me in the chest as hard as you can. So when you do, I can fly back and hit that wall and make you look really good. He said, no, I'll, if I do that, I'll break your chest. I went, bro, I've been kicked by a lot bigger and badder ass guys than you. So just lay it in there and let me do my thing. So we, we left the racquetball court and went to a warehouse and they took patio doors, glass patio doors and glued them together. And on cue, I ran backwards through these patio doors that were real glass it took about an over an hour to pick the glass out of my back where the ems guys were there that's pretty crazy um is that one of your uh, highest paid acting jobs i guess that movie went on to be pretty big no i think over the top probably was okay yeah now, how was that fight scene other than that? Was he was he stiff or was he really easy to work with as a, as a stunt actor? Well, he was fairly easy to work with. But when, when I auditioned for that movie, I went to a dojo over in Hollywood. And when I pulled up to it, there was probably 600 guys out on the sidewalk jumping around like karate guys. And I looked at that and I get, got ready to walk away from it because I wasn't going to stand the line. And somebody hollered, magic, magic, from the door. And it was Sly's bodyguard that had auditioned for the part two. And he told the guys at the door, you need to let this guy in here. You need to let this guy do do this job. So I, I they pulled me in there. I walked in there. And the, and one of, the, one of the directors took a video camera and said, all right, I want to see how well you sell these punches and kicks and stuff. So, so I was sparring with... Uh, the guy that was in blood sport. Uh, I can't remember his name. Uh, anyway, one of the guys he fought blood sport. He was one of John Claus entourage, Michelle uh, QC, I think his name. Anyway, uh, the guy kicks me in the lip. Okay. And my lips bleeding all over the place. And everybody was in the state of shock. Cause I, I guess they'd never seen real blood before. So I said, just give me a minute. Let me go to the bathroom and like butterfly my lip up here and I'll come back and we'll finish this. So I got back there and I said, no, man, you don't need to do, you got the job. You got the job. 
I was the only movie. I was the only guy in that movie that wasn't a martial artist. Well, I'm glad that you made it in because it's very memorable. Your scene there. There's a fan on here asking if anyone randomly came up to you and, and asked to challenge you to an arm wrestling match for a thousand bucks after that uh, over the top appearance. Well, I, I did a lot of exhibitions after that. I wasn't really a professional arm wrestler. I was a big guy and pretty strong, but uh, nobody ever challenged me, but I, I did an exhibition in El Paso once and uh, we were at a bar and I, I think arm wrestled probably 30 people that night. And my arm was like smoked and they brought this nun in. She was like, you know, real big fan of arm wrestling. So they brought this nun in, they made me arm wrestle a nun. And in the beginning of it, they said, do you think you're going to win this match? And I said, well, probably not. I said, cause she's probably going to have God on her side and I doubt I'm going to win. So I let her beat me. Now you mentioned that you fought uh, Steve Strong again in Tales from the Dark Side. We have a fan on here asking how your experience was on Tales from the Dark Side overall. That was a, a lot of fun. Uh, Obviously, the guy that played my manager was uh, Vic Tayback from Mel's Diner. And uh, Steve was a good guy, and I was the bad guy. And I, I, I appeared out of a Coke machine. It was real, you know, out there. So the Coke machine opens. I fly out of there with smoke all around me, and I've got this belt around my waist. And the manager, Vic Tayback, hits this button, and he can make me weigh as much as I want. So I get in the ring with Steve, and we're wrestling. And every time Steve tries to pick me up, Vic would hit the button and make me way too much to pick up. So eventually I'm getting the best of Steve. And, uh, and the, the way the movie ended, somebody threw a, a pitcher of milk on me that made me like start melting out and my belt wouldn't work. And then Steve kicks, drop kicks me and I go over the top rope and I fly back into the coke machine and end up back in hell i guess where i was supposed to be my character name was trog later i had a mastiff that i nicknamed trog after that character now you were also in the tag team tv pilot with jesse ventura and roddy piper that's out now on youtube for anyone that wants to look it up how was that experience and any stories about those two legends uh roddy is probably the best wrestling actor I've ever worked with. And uh, we had a little skirmish. My scene was, I'm supposed to come up and try to rob, rob the cash register. And, Ro and Roddy comes up and tries to save the cash register lady from me and end up monkey flipping me into a big giant box of cereal. Uh, Jesse was a kick too. He was, they were both a lot of fun to work with in that movie. And I, it was a pilot. I don't think it ever got picked up into an actual series, but it's worth watching. It was a real good, it was a real good flick. Were you surprised when Jesse Ventura got elected as governor of Minnesota? Uh, not really. Cause Jesse's got a, a real good line. He's uh, real good with dialogue and a, a good actor. Look at him and, you know, in uh, predator. He knows how to act. He's got a good line. He knows what to say when. So, no, I wasn't surprised. I wish he was there now. Yeah. Now, Mickey Rourke, you've been in, I think, at least three movies with him. He was famous for his wrestler movie. Uh, what was it like working with him? And it looks like some of the pictures on your website, you may be friends with him as well. Uh, I got to know Mickey uh I knew his brother actually, and his brother introduced me to Mickey and I was Mickey's bodyguard for six years. So I got put in all the films that he did pretty much. And by the way, the wrestler movie that he did was about me. He designed his character after my life. So not many people know that, but that's the truth. But, uh, interesting guy, you know, he's real self-destructive, but you know, talented. I, th I thought he did an excellent job in wrestler. He should have won the Academy award. Yeah, and of the three movies you did with them, which was your favorite? Uh, I would say probably, uh, gosh, that's a hard decision, man. I, I'd say probably Johnny Handsome. We did it in New Orleans with Lance Henriksen. Did you happen to see his boxing match that he had a few years ago? I think it may have been in Russia. Uh, Mickey, Mickey thinks he's a boxer. 
and he knows how to box, but Mickey's never fought anybody that really was a good boxer. And I don't think he would do well in the ring because his manager used to pay people off not to hit him in the face. Yeah, it seemed like that may have been a fixed fight when I watched that. Uh, definitely. Now, you you said that he based the wrestler off of you. Um, he told you that, I guess. And what similarities were there between your personality in real life and the wrestler character? Because you seem to be a success after wrestling, unlike that character. Well, they kind of show wrestling as the, the dark side of that sport. It has one for sure. But uh, I was in Vegas with my wife and we were there on vacation and I got a phone call from Mickey saying, have you seen the movie yet? And I said, what movie? He goes, the wrestler, dude, the wrestler, you got to go see it because I designed my character after you and part of it's your life history. And I had long blonde hair. I wore a hearing aid, lived in a van. So that's where all that came from. But uh, it's definitely true you can you can read about it he definitely designed his character after me for the for the movie yeah there's a fan on here that you two says you two have very similar faces um you lived in a van at one point i guess that was after your acting before did you have like a low point in your life before you you got back on track uh i've been homeless twice in my life i lived in a school bus for five years behind the gym I lived in a Volkswagen camper before that. And that's how I became the underground mayor of Gold's Gym. I lived behind the gym and I would go in there at night and train. And I fixed all the equipment and, and moved things around. They hired me to evaluate new equipment when they brought it in there to make sure it was going to last. So that's how I became the underground mayor of Gold's Gym. That's how I, I moved my way up from living in a bus to my first movie. And then I got an apartment and then moved up from there. There's a fan on here asking if you have any Freddie Roach stories. <laughs> no, sorry about that. Don't. What was your training schedule like in your peak uh, physical condition? Because I know you were a bodybuilder too. You had a almost perfect physique, pretty much flawless. Uh, it looks like you probably trained pretty hard in those days. Uh, I trained, when I first started training, I weighed 148 pounds. I gained 100 pounds in five years. My peak weight was 310. I trained three times a day and ate 8,500 calories a day and uh, pretty much didn't do a lot of cardio. I rollerbladed three miles a day, but I trained for 42 years of my life in a gym. So when you say three times a day, would one of those workouts be the rollerblading? What was your split like? Uh, let's say a week split for any, we have a lot of bodybuilders on this channel that would yeah. probably be interested to know. Uh, well, I trained on what they call triple split. So in the morning I would go in and say, do biceps that afternoon after lunch, I would go in and do back. Then I'd go in and do abs or calves and, uh, then I'd rollerblade late in the afternoon when it was cool and I'd, Roller blade like three miles up to Santa Monica Pier and back. But that that was my training regime. Three three times a day. I trained for four days in a row and to take a day off. And as far as diet, do you have any diet tips to get your abs as shredded as yours were in your peak? Uh low carbs, uh, a lot of protein. I my typical diet was wake up in the morning, have a box of raisin bran. And about an hour later, maybe a pound of fruit at lunch, a whole chicken. Two hours later, I'd have maybe some more fruit and the more chicken. By the end of the day, I had three whole chickens to eat. Wow. The raisin bran, uh, I guess at that high protein, was that the reason? No, that was, that was my only, basically my only carbohydrates. I used that for energy during the day. There's a fan on here asking what the toughest movie you've ever done was. Uh, I'd say probably Grunt because uh, I had to wrestle a lot of people and uh, not knowing I wasn't a professional wrestler. So a lot of the bumps I was taking were pretty crucial. And the end of the movie, I don't know if you've watched it closely. When Steve and I have this shootout at the end of the movie, he hits me in the head with a chain and then all the scenes you see were me coming down in the ring on a motorcycle 
and diving off the bike and jumping in and saving uh, my tag team partner's life by intercepting a drop kick. There was a lot of, uh, I got suplexed over the top rope the first day I did this movie. I'd never been suplexed before in my whole life. So there was a lot of uh, heavy duty shit going on in that thing. How did you like the woman that played Lola in it? I think your your wife, I think that was her name. Yeah, she was a, she actually took a pretty good bump in that movie. She got drop kicked, I think. But uh, I wasn't allowed to say a lot in that movie. I, I they want they hired me for my ability more than my acting skills. But yeah, she she got a black eye in that movie. And you were also in Runaway Train with John Voight. How was he to work with? Uh, I didn't get to work a whole lot with him, but I worked with his uh, Eric. Uh, what's his last name? Eric Roberts. And uh, what what time I did get to talk to him, he seemed like a really cool guy. I thought that was an awesome movie, man. He played a killer role in that as an ex convicts You know, the the ending was crazy. And the Stone Cold movie with Brian Bosworth, they played that a lot on TBS back uh, back in the 90s. How was that experience being on that film? Uh, I was Brian's bodyguard for five and a half months. That movie was supposed to be a four to six week shoot. It ended up being eight months. And we, uh, we got to be good friends. Uh, I was a coordinator stunt coordinator and the assistant to the director on a lot of the scenes for the bikers because I was kind of a biker guy. But uh, it was a good movie. I built Brian's bike and I also built Lance Hendrickson's bike for that movie. And I helped build the stunt bike. And that movie, I did the most expensive stunt, motorcycle stunt done in Hollywood for quite a few years. It cost $4 million to kill me. Wow. And what was involved in that? It's been a while since I've seen that one. Well, I, uh, I come down the hallway with Lance Hendrickson on the back of my bike and Lance gets off and tells me to go kill him. So I take my bike and rev the motor up coming down the hallway toward Brian and Brian shoots me off the bike with a shotgun. My bike flies out of the window and blows a helicopter up, goes down and blows seven cars up in the parking lot. And we snuck in there on Sunday, the secretary of state got us in there. And when they found out about it, they impeached him two weeks later. Now, as far as your wrestling career, you were obviously trained by Mondo Guerrero for Grunt. Who brought you into the actual wrestling business to perform in professional matches? That'd be Mondo. Mondo introduced me to a lot of people in Red Bestine as well. Uh, I moved my way up from the local matches in California and then I went to Hawaii and I wrestled Jimmy Snuka and a bunch of guys over there. Then I went up the coast of California and got got to be a seasoned, semi-season professional. And then I went to Japan a lot and uh, then fought all over the country from there on. Who did you work for when you were wrestling over in Japan? Uh, all Japan Wrestling. So that would have been probably Terry Funk who brought you in there. Well, Terry had something to do with it. Yeah, we 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 showed up there a lot together because we're both from California or from near California. He's living in Amarillo, but he spent a lot of time in L.A. because we was doing movies. But yeah, he was instrumental in getting me over there. Were you usually a heel or babyface? Me? Yes. Always bad guy. Everything I've ever done. Interesting. Yeah. Did you ever work with uh, Judo Gene LaBelle, either in movies or wrestling? Gene is a very close friend of mine. Uh, I went to his dojo, and, of course, the first time you go to Gene's dojo, you get choked out to see the reality of all this. But Gene was my judo coach, and I, I took judo from Gene right at the time I tried to get into the UFC and do and work there. But I just I was too old for it back then. As far as your training for that original UFC, when it was pretty much no holds barred, how were you preparing? Because we didn't really know. There was no MMA training back then. It was kind of do your own thing. <laughs> well, I was a pretty good street fighter, so that helped. But my judo experience helped me a lot. I, I didn't fight a lot of people. I fought Tank Abbott, and uh, I was around the Gracie era 
but I didn't fight anybody that was stupendously all-star. So I, I just, by the time I realized that it wasn't for me, I quit. And then obviously it took off from there, but it was no gloves, no rounds. And sometimes you fought six fights in one night. If you uh, had any friends in the wrestling business, uh, who would you have been close to? Like, did you travel with anybody uh, or were you a loner? Uh, pretty much a loner. You know, my wrestling school was uh, Red Bastine trains and Billy trained some people in, uh, in California at a gym, a racquetball gym they converted into a wrestling school. And my school was uh, the uh, Ultimate Warrior and Sting and uh, Archangel from Canada. Remember him? Yeah, the Angel of Death. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, those guys were in my wrestling school. But when I traveled, I pretty much stayed to myself. How was the Ultimate Warrior back in those days? Well, pretty stiff because he was a bodybuilder that converted into wrestling and he didn't quite pick up the whole idea and he and sting went from california down south and i think they worked for crockett for a while down there and he sort of got got the ropes you know figured it all out but he was pretty stiff now i understand you auditioned for rambo i've seen the picture on your website the big bofetti is asking what your audition for rambo was like <laughs> well i didn't really get to have a big one i, I wasn't really uh big enough because I just cut up for a show I was in. So I was about 202 then, but uh, I just went in there, read for the part and wore some camouflage and put a headband on. So I didn't know what to expect, but obviously I didn't get it. But uh, Sly and I knew each other back then as well. Dolph Lundgren, you also uh, are friends with, did you work with him or are you friends just from living in Hollywood together? Hollywood pretty much. I see. Were you ever approached about being in any of the Rocky films? No, uh, -uh I wasn't. Uh, but I, I helped train Carl Withers on a, a couple of episodes, you know, not episodes, but a couple of, uh, uh, times he asked me to show him some pointers on how to train. Now I've seen the picture on your website of you and Brooke Shields. Was she one of your personal trainees or was she a friend from something else? No, I was her bodyguard. Uh, she came and read for uh, one of the parts in Johnny Handsome. And her mom showed up there with her. And my job was just kind of protect her because she, she had some issues when she was younger. I think she got kidnapped by a production company or something. So I got hired to be her bodyguard for, you know, a couple of days. Who were some of the other celebrities that we would recognize that you've done bodyguard work for? Uh Mickey Rourke, uh, Princess Caroline and Monaco. Uh, let's see, those are probably the, some of the most famous ones. Uh, I probably would mention it, but you wouldn't probably know who they are. Just people that were wealthy and they wanted to be protected. And, you know, I traveled with a guy that used to, his mom owned Jones of New York. I worked for him 13 years. We traveled a lot, went over all of Europe and stuff. So I worked with him a lot. What was the uh, most intense situation you came into as a bodyguard, or was it all pretty easy stuff? Well, not intense, but but kind of touchy. I was in uh, Sardinia, Italy with Princess Caroline, and we were kept dodging a paparazzi all the time, and I had a lot of issues with them. But once I figured out how they operate, I, I, got, a, I got a handle on it. But she was a lot of fun to work with. You know, I had a lot of good times over there. I know you can't really talk about your uh, your motorcycle club stuff, but have you been in many life or death situations over your life? Uh, no, not really. I kind of strayed away from my slum come and I, had, I was pretty sharp on that kind of stuff. And you still make custom bikes. Uh, there's a lot of pictures of your bikes on your website. Could you talk to us about some of the bikes that you've built? Well, I built a lot of movie star bikes. I had a shop in Hollywood called Harleywood and uh, I built Aerosmith, Billy Idol, uh, on and on. I built Lance Hendrickson's bike and, and obviously Brian's bike for that movie. But I had the only shop in town that all the celebrities came to. So I worked on Billy Gibbons bike a few times, Dwight Yoakam, you know, a bunch of celebrities. I can't remember half of them, but 
I, I build cars now. I had, I always had the fastest bike. I set a world's land speed record in 1969. I went 204 miles an hour on a Harley. And uh, I've always had fast bikes. So people brought me their bikes to make them go fast and look good. But I do mostly hot rods and custom cars now. What kind of vehicles do you own now? Uh, I've got 20 cars, mostly like 1934 Fords. Uh, 1967 Chevelle, 31 Ford, two-door sedan, uh, 74 Ford Bronco, you know, you know, stuff like that. That's quite a collection. I guess you must have a decent-sized property to store all of those. Yeah, my wife and I, we've got an airplane hangar. I keep all my stuff inside there. I noticed on your website you have a helicopter, too, or at one point you had a helicopter. Yeah, we did. I was taking lessons trying to learn how to fly it. And uh, the guy that we were sharing a helicopter with one morning had his pilot come try to come get him. And the pilot took off and ended up crashing it. So we no longer are part of that. There's a fan on here asking if you have any future movies in the works or acting jobs. And is there any actor you would have loved to work with but didn't? Well, I guess the, the most enjoyable experience I ever had with actor would be Michael Landon. Uh, probably the nicest guy I ever met, the most talented director that probably will ever live. Uh, I don't have any future plans for any movies, but you never know nowadays what's going to happen. Uh, I enjoyed the movie business. It's a little bit stressful at times. You don't get a lot of sleep and you're dealing with, you know, being on time, being there, doing the right thing. But it, it was fun. I would do another movie if somebody offered me one. There's a fan asking if you were friends with Paul Sullivan, who used to be a regular at Gold's Gym, and he was in Over the Top. Yeah, I know Paul pretty well. Paul was also a homeless person. He lived in his car for quite a while, and he was in Over the Top as well. But Paul could never quite get there. He He's a great guy. He just doesn't have the motivation, I guess, to go out and make it happen. And I, I wish him well. I hope he's doing well. I haven't seen him in a while. I know he's on Facebook, but uh, he's a good guy. He's a good guy. I noticed the picture online of you and Hulk Hogan. Did you guys just cross paths or did you actually know each other? Uh, I was in the gym once one night. I came in there to work out. And my hair was pretty blonde. I had a real good tan, blonde beard, you know, white kind of beard like I have now. And the guy at the counter says, there's your brother's back there training. I, I looked back there and I went, wow, he kind of looks like me. And we sort of, I've sort of went around the gym and eventually we ended up side by side. And I said, Hey man, I guess we look enough alike to know each other. My name's magic. And he says, my name's uh, Terry Belia. They call me the Hulk. And I said, so how'd you end up here? He goes, uh, I'm living in my van down in Venice on the beach and I'm supposed to be doing this Rocky movie thing with this guy. And I said, cool. He goes, yeah, I don't know how it's going to work out, but I'm living in my van. So you'll probably see me working out here a few times. So that was before he ever got famous. So I guess he was pretty down to earth in those days. Yeah, I got along with him. Well, I mean, uh, you know, the boys kind of respected each other a little bit, but he, everybody changes when you get famous and some people change for the best. Some people change for the worse, you know, did you ever have any WWE job offers? I freelance for the WWF at the time I've done, did a few matches with them, but nothing. Uh, I, I didn't want to ever sign with the WWF cause I was doing movies and I didn't want to surrender a bunch of the money I make to Vince. So I just decided freelance. So you would have just been brought in to do enhancement work or house show matches back in those days? Yeah, pretty much, you know. But like like I said, when you sign with Vince, you give away a lot of percentage of what you make because he thinks you made you famous. Right. What's your favorite wrestling match you ever had? Uh, I'd say probably Dr. D. David Schultz. And it was my last match, my last official wrestling match. And it, it was basically a shoot from the beginning. Uh, it's on YouTube. Just type in Harley Davidson wrestler. You'll find it. Now I've interviewed David Schultz. He's an interesting guy. Uh, why was it a shoot just stiff or was he actually trying to harm you in the match? 
No, we just wanted to make this match heavy duty because we had built this match up for about four months as a grudge match. I ended up uh, breaking an electric guitar over his head. So we ended up getting this grudge match going just, to, you know, try to make this match, sell more tickets and stuff. But uh, he's a good wrestler, knows what he's doing. And neither one of us got hurt that badly, but it was definitely a shoot. Would, you, would Japan have been your most famous territory or was there another territory that you were best known in? Uh, probably California and Hawaii. I wrestled a lot back and forth there. I, I wrestled Snuka and Arn, not Arn Anderson. Uh, there's another Anderson. I can't remember his Gene name. Gene Anderson maybe or Oli. Oli. There you go. And uh, a lot of the old guys we used to go back and forth from California to Hawaii and we wrestled over there. My first match was with uh, Farmer Boy Epo. He weighed 400 pounds, and he beat me up so bad that when I got back in the dressing room, he was laying down in the shower because he was gassed from beating me up so bad. What did you think about the whole Jimmy Snuka murder allegations that, that came out in recent years before he passed? Man, I don't know a whole lot about that. I just know him from him being Jimmy Snuka. I always had a lot of respect for him because I thought he was probably one of the best built bodybuilding wrestlers that ever was in his era and uh, really talented, never really said much. So I don't really know much about that whole thing. I, I know about the Bruiser Brody murder and that was pretty bad. And that was sad. What was your reaction when you, when you heard what happened to Brody as someone that grew up with Brody? Really saddened because uh, deep down inside, he had a big heart and he was a really nice guy when he was out of the ring. But I, I just, it was sad the way it happened and it, nothing ever happened to the guy that stabbed him. And that was really even worse. So I just felt really bad and sorry, you know, I felt sorry for his family and his wife. Did you ever wrestle over in Puerto Rico? No, never went there. I know that uh, you have at least one uh, one handgun, according to your website. When you were a heel wrestler, back in the days where it was often wrestlers would get attacked, did you usually carry a gun on you? No, actually, my favorite weapon was a bullwhip. I used a bullwhip in like four of my movies, and I was real well known for it. So I carried that in my wrestling bag all the time, just in case I wanted to do an exhibition. And it was also a self-defense thing. But I never really gotten into any jams with anybody. Now the fans always like me to ask about the groupies. Were the groupies better as a as a Hollywood actor or as a wrestler? Probably an actor. You know, I got a pretty good fan base from over the top. I get phone calls from like the U.S. Navy when they're having an arm wrestling match on an aircraft carrier. They all get my number and they call me and just to get a pep talk and see how I'm doing. You know and send a picture if you can, that kind of thing. Now for uh, training abs, that's one area that I uh, am looking to improve on. Do you have any tips for abdominal training? Hanging leg raises and doing sit-ups on an incline bench. That's about it. I wouldn't do anything else. And as far as uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, did you ever run into him when you were uh, doing the Gold's Gym scene? Uh, Arnold and I don't get along very well together. The, the opening of the world's gym, uh, in Venice, when Joe gold moved it over there, they had an opening party and I was there and I was with my ex-wife and a guy named Rick Valenti. And, and I'm wearing this Western shirt that looks like the kind John Wayne used to wear. Right. And, uh, Arnold walks up to me and says, who do you think you are? Johnny cash. And I said, how about we do this? How about we go outside and I kick your ass? How about that? And I thought to myself, whether if, he, if I do happen to somehow miraculously lose this fight, it's going to be National Enquirer material. And if I win the fight, it's still going to be National Enquirer material. So I left it there and he walked away and we never really talked after that. Now, I've seen you have Lou Ferrigno pictures on your website. So I guess your experience with Lou was a little better. Lou is a sweetheart guy. Uh, I used to be an expediter of all the bodybuilding shows with Kent Keen. We did all the America and some of the Olympias and a lot of the old shows. And Louie was always there. Sometimes he'd guest pose. 
And because we were both deaf, I'm not deaf anymore. I had my ears redone, but because Louis was deaf, we both related to each other. And uh, I've known him ever since, I think, 1970. And uh, I'm really glad to see that he got somewhere in the world of acting and made something out of himself because he deserved it. A really nice guy. Franco Colombo, of course, passed away, I think, around a year or so ago. Did you ever have much contact with him? And what did you think about his passing, which was kind of sudden? I, I never really got to know Franco. I mean, I know a lot about him, but I've never really uh, uh, hung out with him and never really knew much other than bodybuilding about him. I guess he would have been in Arnold's clique. Oh, definitely. For sure. Best friends. Best friends. There's a fan on here asking what your heaviest weight would have been. 310. And the fans always like to know the best uh, bench press, squat, and deadlift. Uh, I wasn't a big bench presser because it's really bad for you, and you you can tear your pec real easy, and that ends your career of whatever you're going to do. Uh, I could do a 475 bench, and I did, a, I think, a 550 squat, and I think six something deadlift. I wasn't a bench presser. I did dumbbells. When you did dumbbells, did you keep your hands turned slightly in, or were they this similar to bench press? Similar to bench press. Similar okay. to bench press. And you found obviously it worked for you. You got as much uh, development. I guess you did incline dumbbells too. Yes, incline dumbbells, flat dumbbell presses, and dumbbell flies and cross cable flies. That was all I ever did. There's a fan asking, biggest Richard Cranium, what do you think of The Rock going from wrestling to being the highest paid male Hollywood actor? I'm going to guess you may have met him in Hawaii. <laughs> I met Rock when he was 14 years old. I wrestled his dad all the time in Hawaii, and Rock was always there on the sideline. But you know what? Humble guy, deserves everything he's gotten. Great actor good athlete and uh, a good role model for a lot of kids. What's the best uh, place to have tacos in San Antonio? Someone's asking. Blanco Cafe. Now I've seen on your website, you uh, develop fly fishing lures. I'm guessing you're a big fisherman. And how did you start making your own uh, tackle? Uh, a friend of mine turned me on to fly fishing, and after that, I went all over the world doing it. And I learned how to tie my own flies and stuff, which is rewarding. And I was training for the world's longest uh, fly casting. I wanted to get the world record on that, but I got involved in a lot of other things, kind of got in the way. But I'm still probably going to do that at some point. But uh, I had a, a lot of good, a lot of good friends in fly fishing. Got to meet a lot of really cool people and travel a lot to some really exotic places and i shoot guns a lot i shoot bow and arrows throw knives you name it now you've been all over the world from wrestling acting motorcycle riding fishing photography what are some of your favorite places to to visit italy is probably the one norway would be the second and probably ireland i enjoyed all three of those a lot Norway. I don't know much about Norway. What was so special about Norway? I know the women are beautiful. <laughs> well, not only that, the place is super clean. The air is pure and there's no pollution and everybody's friendly. I rode my bike there and really enjoyed going there. I, I rode, I, I rode the Norway from, uh, I, I covered four continents in one and a half months. So I ended up in Norway and then I got on the ferry and went all the way across the ocean to England and got went to England, Ireland, Scotland, came back through Germany. So Norway was the cleanest country I think I've ever been in. There's a fan on here asking if you're familiar with Dennis Newman, the bodybuilder. Yeah, I knew Dennis. I knew Dennis. He's a good guy. He had a great physique. He just couldn't. I think he had some health problems at some point and had to get out of it. What do you think about what bodybuilding has become? Because back when you were training at Gold's, I think that's when they had the best physiques. Now it's almost like dinosaurish physiques with the big uh, human growth hormone bellies and so forth. But 
what do you think about where the sport is now compared to where it was? Well, one of my favorite bodybuilders was always Frank Zane. I always thought he had a real complete physique. It was like streamlined. And like you said, the, the drugs have gotten into the sport and I doubt it'll ever be the same again. I, I was in an era called the golden era and my training partner was Tom Platts for seven years. And I've watched everybody come and go and crater and die and get hurt. I, I just feel like that the sport now is about how much money you can spend on the drugs, not how intelligently you can train. Now, obviously there were some drugs back in those days, but there wasn't as, as many of them. Uh, there's always some bodybuilders out here that, that like to know, we don't obviously encourage it, but if there's any cycle that you would recommend. <laughs> well, I would say because I, a lot of people have been dying lately. I would say try to stay away from it if you can. And, uh, I mean, I've done my share. I'm no holy grail here. But uh, I, I would say try to train to your potential as much as you can with naturally. And uh, in the old days, we used Decadurabolin and Anavar and Winstrol. And that was probably about it. But you can see the difference of the way the growth hormone has taken the sport away from everything and i guess because the testosterone would uh, cause you to retain too much water you'd stay away from the test compounds uh do a little test just to keep your androgen levels up but you know the problem is when you start doing too much testosterone it converts to estrogen and then you're holding water and then you're not doing your body any good there's a fan on here asking, who was the strongest guy at Gold's when you were there? Well, the strongest guy that came through there was Bill Casimir, no doubt. Nobody even close. Then there was uh, a couple other guys. Uh, there was one, Ted Arcides, passed through there every once in a while. He was a heavy bench press guy, and Tony Atlas. But Bill Casimir was probably the strongest guy to ever waltz through that door. Tony Atlas is one of our most popular interviews on this channel. Any thoughts on him? <laughs> Tony's a character, man. He would always, uh, he and Ted Arcides would always go at each other over bench pressing. And of course, Ted could smoke him, but Tony had a, had a, a shoe fetish, a f female shoe fetish, and he would collect shoes from girls, but a uh, strong guy, good wrestler, funny, nice to be around. There's a fan on here from Ireland that heard you say you liked Ireland and he wants to know if you've heard of Cork. I don't think so, but I really enjoyed Ireland and uh, the people there were incredible. Uh, the scenery is incredible. It's just they're fun people, really nice. I rode my bike around the whole country pretty much. I never had an issue and just really, really fun people to be around. Did you ever wrestle up here in Canada? One time I went to Calgary, I think, and that was about it. The, the one time was enough. That's a pretty brutal territory. <laughs> yeah, that's when uh, the angel of death was still. He and uh, Steve, uh, God, I can't remember his name. It's kind of hard to remember back to me's name. Salvo, maybe. There you go. I went up there with those two guys. Yeah, it's a lot. The weather's a lot worse than uh, California as well. Oh, yeah. For sure. Well, I lived in Montana for a while, so I know about cold weather. This is a good question. What was it like to train legs with uh, Tom Platts and the, the failure training that Tom Platts is known for? Well, training with Tom was not only his failing, but your failing too, because he would go on a leg extension for probably 20 minutes on one set, and he would fail, and he you would Oh, it looks like we have a connection. Oh, we, we lost you for about yeah. five seconds. Sorry about that. Uh, Tom, one set would take 20 seconds on a leg extension machine. And he would help him to failure. And then you would fail yourself helping him. But I saw him do, I saw him do 48 reps with 405 one day on the squat rack. Now, a lot of wrestlers have bad knees. As you went on uh, with wrestling, did you continue to do squats? Because I know squats can also be hard on the knees. 
No, I quit squatting because uh, it was affecting my back. I, I have a machine right now that I've got on the market that's probably the most phenomenal leg machine that you could ever use. It's called Pro Strider. And myself and my business partner, Brian Bosworth, are marketing it. And because of the COVID-19, we've kind of put it on hold because none of the teams are training with it. But uh, I've got it to some colleges have bought it and several private individuals are using it. I've got some MMA athletes using it. And later on, we'll talk about this because this thing is the most crazy machine that you could ever use for your legs and your cardio. Yeah, we'll have you back on for sure to discuss that uh, when that comes out. Last question here from a fan because I know you, you're a busy guy. Ivan Drago is asking, where was the restaurant that you wrestled um, uh, Sylvester Stallone at and over the top? It was a, a truck stop north of uh, Valencia, right near Magic Mountain. And it was, if you notice, everybody in there sweating. It was probably 150 degrees inside that place because they can't, they can't run the air conditioners when they're shooting because obviously the microphones would pick it all up. But it was a truck stop. And uh, we did that scene probably three times. And every time we did it, it got more intense. Yeah, it was definitely an intense scene. Uh, you mentioned your leg machine coming out. Do you have a website for that yet where anyone can look at it? I'm working on it right now. I'll probably be up in another, probably this month. I, I've been kind of put it all on hold because really with this COVID thing, I can't really do any marketing with it because nobody's training on right now. So, but I'm telling you what, it, I've never had anybody go on it over a minute. And I, I really want to encourage him MMA athletes to use it because it will help their cardio beyond belief. Do you have any social media where people can follow you? You mentioned you have the website magicschwartz.com. No, I pretty much uh, stay in low light on all that. I haven't really exploited that. My wife's always asking me to start fan club, but I haven't done that yet. And I'll probably, probably do that this year or the first of next year. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us. Uh, you've led a very interesting life, and hopefully we can have you back another day uh, to talk more about your machine and, and other stuff that you've done. Is there anything you'd like to say to the, to the fans here as we wrap up? I'd like to thank everybody that's ever watched any of my movies or watched any of my wrestling matches, and I, I appreciate you're being a good fan and it was a pleasure being with you on this show and anything I can ever do to help you guys with more interviews or more stories. Don't hesitate to ask. Thank you. And as I said, that Devin Larrick guy, he happens to have the same name as me, but he's a legitimate world arm wrestling champion. When I had him on my podcast a few weeks ago, he put out a challenge to you. And I was just wondering if you could close this off as the smasher and and say a message to Devin Larratt, who said he could beat you in an arm wrestling match. Well, Devin, I got $100,000 that says I can beat you. You want it? If you do, come back here and I'll break your arm off. So take that and stash it where the 